welcome and good morning everyone here in the room. Good day, good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us online from around the globe. Welcome to the Intra Resilience Global Partnership Annual Forum 2023, paving the way for the global shield against climate risks. My name is Mino Hemati and I'm happy and honored to be moderating some of this annual forum for you today. I've been thrilled to learn more about recent developments of the Intra Resilience Global Partnership, the Global Shield Against Climate Risks, and how the transition to this new and larger initiative will unfold. I've been involved in supporting the development of the Governance Charter for Intra Resilience in 2020, and then and today I did this as a consultant to GIZ's Partnerships 2030 program, which is providing all kinds of support to multi-stakeholder partnerships. But let's turn to the annual forum 2023. I'm sure you're as pleased and relieved as we are that we can finally come together in person in the partnership again after the past online events due to COVID. I mean, virtual is great, but in person is mostly greater. A lot has happened uh, in the past months and weeks. The annual report was published, showcasing the great successes of the partnership. The Intra Resilience High Level Consultative Group convened in May to conclude the way forward towards the Global Shield against climate risks, and the Global Shield website was launched. Today, we take the time to reflect on past successes, share our experiences of the past year, and discuss the way forward. Let's all have a look at the agenda for today. Here's the overview from now until the end of the reception tonight. The next slides show a little more detail. We begin with opening remarks by the partnership's leadership, setting the scene for the day. This is followed by the keynote speech on a multifaceted approach to climate risks that the Global Shield is taking. After a short coffee break, we will have a panel discussion among practitioners about how to unlock the Global Shield's potential with opportunities for you here in the room and participants online to ask questions and make comments. Lunch is scheduled for 12 noon until 2 p.m., so it's good time for networking. And in the afternoon, after lunch, there were our five breakout sessions running in parallel. And in order to help you decide and learn where you need to go, we will need meet here in plenary at 2 p.m. The colleagues leading the breakout sessions will briefly present what the sessions are about and will help you find the ones that you want to participate in. The sessions are scheduled for 60 minutes and afterwards from 3.30 to 4, we have another coffee break and what we call a gallery walk to see materials and tools by five partner organizations. By the way, this is outside through the coffee area uh, and in the room just opposite and available throughout the day. Afterwards, during what we call evening sessions, there will be a panel discussion on the Global Shield financing vehicles, something that I'm sure many of you are very interested in. Uh, equally, uh, you are going to be interested in the presentation following that panel on gender smart practices in CDRF CDRFI programs, you love your acronyms, by the Partnership Center of Excellence. Astrid Zwick, um, the head of the Secretariat, will then be um, giving closing remarks before an evening reception for the official launch of the Global Shield Solutions Platform. You see there are many speakers from all stakeholders, partners and members from around the globe. The whole day is a veritable firework of brief and very brief inputs. We hope this agenda will provide the information that you're seeking, but also stimulate interaction and dialogue on the stage, in the room, with participants online, in the breakout sessions, and of course, during the breaks. A few bits of housekeeping uh, remain before we dive in. Uh, you all know that this session is being live streamed and recorded. There's a photographer who will take pictures throughout the day. About the translation, we do have simultaneous translation into French and Spanish. If you don't have a headset yet and require one, they are outside uh, with the colleagues at the desk in the coffee area. And by the way, the headsets are not giveaways, but please hand them back before you leave. 
Online, you also uh, have simultaneous translation. Uh, select your channel for French, that is one and two Spanish. I believe that is correct. Um, uh, you can do this on the bottom right of your screen. You find the setting for languages, streaming quality, and full screen. And on the bottom left, you find the audio on-off switch that you have to click if you want to hear us. For urgent phone calls and the like, use the small room uh, just opposite the plenary hall where you can have some peace and quiet if you need to. Bathrooms are located just outside the plenary hall on the left. And in case you experience any technical issues, please send an email to the address here, insureresilience at obsession.de. I think we can remember that. Uh, or call the number uh, that is given there. If you feel you might need it, uh, you might want to take a photo. Online participants, please write your questions and comments in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. And by the way, you can't see the chat when you're in full screen mode, so you will have to switch. The chat is being moderated throughout the day, and I will ask for questions and comments from online participants during Q&A. And if you wish, please use the chat now and throughout the day to introduce yourselves uh, to each other. Those here in the room, I ask to, to not log into the live stream at the same time. Some people have created that habit. It might overstress the channel, so we ask you to not do that. In case there's anything else you need, an aspirin, a taxi, a summer holiday, whatever, please talk to the colleagues at the registration desk uh, who will provide what they can to help you where you got your badge. Thanks, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. Now let's set the scene for the day. Since its inception in 2017, the joint leadership between the Vulnerable 20, the V20 group, and the G20 has been a hallmark of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. And it is my pleasure to announce three distinguished speakers representing the leadership of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. To officially open the event, we will hear a statement by His Excellency Sidi Keita, Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs of the Gambia and V20 co-chair of the Intro Resilience Global Partnership. We are also joined today by the Honorable Dr. Henry Kokofu, Special Envoy of the Climate Vulnerable Forum Presidency and Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana. Thirdly, I would like to welcome Heike Hen, Director for Climate, Energy and Environment at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, who's jumping in for Excellency Ms. Kofler, the G20 co-chair of the Inter Resilience Global Partnership. Thank you for being here. Let us begin with His Excellency C.D. Keita, Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs from the Gambia, formerly also Minister for Trade, Industry, Regional Integration, and employment. His Excellency's background is in business administration, financial management, and financial strategy, and he has also served as the finance director of the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector in Jeddah before he was appointed minister in 2020. The minister has kindly provided a video message to welcome us this morning. Let's have the video, please. Greetings from Sham el I am pleased to be recording this video after a very successful Insul Resilient High Level Consultative Group on meeting on the margins of the African Development Bank annual meeting. My key outcome of is that we confirm the new Global Shield Board structures and in country consultation. As the Minister of Finance of the Gambia, I am pleased to see the progress having just launched about six months ago, that we are moving quickly towards implementation arrangements. I am pleased to share with everyone that in 2022, Insu Resilience reached 190 million beneficiaries. As we build from the lessons and work to scale up what is working in Insu Resilient Global Partnership, I am pleased that the Global Shield take this challenge to deliver a portfolio of rearranged and trigger-based financing to cooperatively close the ever-widening financial projects on Singapore. V20's co-leadership of this team 
a team that I am glad to be part of has come a long way in our shared attempt to deploy the real financial protection solutions for our economy, our enterprises, and our communities. Colleagues and friends, getting the financial dimensions right in our global interconnected economy is indispensable to a proper response in both challenges. Action is long overdue, but it is certainly not too late to pick up the pace. And with that, I would like to take this opportunity to share two key initiatives to deliver better deliver for the most vulnerable. We share the Accra Marrakesh Agenda Roadmap, which calls for deep reforms of the international and development finance system, where Global Shield plays a key role in revolutionizing this money. We are further drafting our climate prosperity plans as a vehicle to spur development positive climate action. Implementation of climate prosperity plans has realized shared prosperity by driving new investment, resilience, and promoting their sustainability. Thank you for your attention and your honorary support of our joint initiative. With this message, I officially move to open today's annual forum. Thank you. We thank Minister Keita for his opening remarks, highlighting the urgency of development positive climate action. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce our second speaker, Honorable Dr. Henry Kokofu from Ghana, Special Envoy of the Climate Vulnerable Forum and Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana. Dr. Kokofu's background is in natural resource management, agroforestry, and law, and he has also served as a member of parliament of Ghana until 2016. Thank you, Dr. Kokofu, for offering your opening remarks, not only on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, but also as a representative of Ghana, one of the Pathfinder countries under the Global Shield. Dr. Kokofu, if you'd like to join me, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Good morning, colleagues, participants. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to address this gathering today on behalf of the CVF V20 Ghana Presidency. And here, I'm happy to um, announce the greetings from his Excellency Nana Dodankwa Kufuato, the President of the Republic of Ghana, who happens to be the Chair of the CVF, and then the Honorable Minister for Finance, um, Honorable Ken Ufuriata, who also happens to be the Chair of the V20. Closing the financial protection gap is an uphill battle, and we recognize the significant role that the Insurance Resilience Global Partnership or the IGP has played in unpacking the climate and disaster risk financing and insurance architecture in advancing pragmatic solutions for climate vulnerable countries since its inception in 2017. This was done to realize the Insure Resilience Vision 2025, protecting over 500 million people against climate risks by 2025 and we are very much aware of this unfinished business. The scale of the financial protection challenge can be meaningfully understood from loss and damage statistics. And here, the V20, for example, lost some 500 billion over US dollars over the last two decades. That's from 2000 to 2019. This means the V20, which, um, I will be happy to remind ourselves the V20 stroke the CVF represents about 58 countries ac across the globe, from Africa, the Pacific, Caribbean, 
and the Asian as well as the Middle East and has a total population of 1.5 billion people. The V20 would be 20% wealthier today if not for climate change and its antecedent climate catastrophes. Um, that these are worrying elements. That is, it is projected to lose an additional 200 billion US dollars through 2027. Even if we keep to the 1.5 degree Celsius limit of the Paris Agreement. In Africa, the continent lost approximately $200 billion in the same period and continues to lose wealth with every severe dry spell, every flood, and slow onset events. In my own country, Ghana, we, we lost um, some amount of um, economic gains. And the World Bank in 2022 reported, uh, re report wants that without urgent climate actions, at least one million more people could fall into poverty due to climate shocks and income could reduce by up to 40% for poor households by 2050. Between 2009 and 2019, Ghana experienced approximately 15.2 billion US dollars in economic losses from climate events. These numbers give glaring evidence of the economic realities of climate change in climate vulnerable countries. In this regard, we welcome the UNFCCC Loss and Damage Fund, but I want to also reiterate our call as the CVF strokes V20 that this bank account must not remain empty. The Laws and Damage Fund at the UNFCCC must be capitalized at the earliest. Meanwhile, we need to get creative in how we address the significant financial protection gap. The Global Shield Against Climate Risks, which is the financial protection element of the V20-led climate prosperity plans, complements the UNFCCC Loss and Damage Fund. The V20 Loss and Damage Funding Program under the Global Shield aims to inform the design of the UNFCCC Loss and Damage Fund. So in that sense, our work is key in informing the broader conversation on loss and damage. We need a range of context-specific solutions to address the gap, and this we can truly achieve with the IGPs transitioning to the global shield against climate risk. We need to think prosperity, as that is what is at stake when financial protection is lacking. This is why the recently launched V20's Accra Marrakesh gender, or the A to M, is also seeking to revolutionize risk management for our climate insecure world while accelerating efforts to put in place participatory finance, i.e. prearranged and trigger-based funds for loss and damage. A to M also advocates for the mainstreaming of surveillance and monitoring of climate risks of all kinds. And here we're talking about fiscal transition and spillovers. In international institutions, finance and credit rating practices, including through the landmark G7 V20 Global Shield against climate risks. The streamlined deployment of global Shell resources in the first cohort of pathfinder countries, further capitalization of the global field, global shield, including its leadership by the V20, will be the hallmark of success. Above all, countries will need to be in the driver's seat to realize the ambitions of the global shield. Finally, on behalf of the Ghana CVF V20 presidency, I want to express our deepest appreciation to the co collaboration, collaborative partnership of the G7 through the leadership of Germany, France, European Union, Denmark, various multilateral organizations, 
private sector organizations, civil society, academia, think tanks that have worked relentlessly to shape financial protection architecture to where it is today. The best is yet to come, and it is our hope that the Global Shield will build and leverage on the foundational work done by the INSU resilience community. I thank you for your indulgence. May God bless us all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kokofu, for these remarks, also sharing some of the numbers that urge us all to take action and generate the means uh, that is necessary also for protection and also for your appreciation for everybody who's been in this community working uh, towards um, getting, this, getting this done and getting the Global Shield set up. Thank you very much. Let us now welcome our third scene-setting speaker, Dr. Heike Hen. She's kindly representing Her Excellency State Secretary Be Bärbel Kofler today, who unfortunately is not able to join us. Heike Hen is the Director for Climate, Energy and Environment at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Her background is in political science, economics and law, and she has served in various positions in the BMZ since 2003, including focus areas such as African development, food security and collaboration with stakeholders. Dr. Hen, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, sincere thanks also to the uh, minister and his uh, video, but also specifically to our Honorable uh, Special Envoy Kokofu for setting the scene and really highlighting what is at stake here um, uh, regarding the effect of climate uh, change, the fiscal space shrinking um, for developing countries, and also showcasing the situation of Ghana. And I think this is what today is about, um, how to address it and how we jointly as a multi-stakeholder forum can make progress. And I would also like to comment on, on some of the aspects that you highlighted, uh, Honorable Special Envoy. You were making the link between climate change impact and development. And uh, from the perspective of BMZ, this is really key. Um, we are a strong believer in the Paris Agreement, in the SDGs, and the third belief is that those go hand in hand. And we cannot achieve the one without uh, the other. And therefore, um, our engagement in the whole climate spectrum, mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, is always also about a way for prosperity and development globally for all countries. So thank you so much for these remarks. And also thanking you already for highlighting my first main message is really um, applauding uh, the results and the achievements of the Inter Resilience Global Partnership. And you were recounting some of the numbers. We have 130 partnerships, uh, partners already in the injury resilience. And what is more important, the impact for people right now on the ground. 190 million, I think, was the number you mentioned. And that is uh, what the injury resilience partnership is about. And looking back, not only at the last years, but also the last year, I think all of you, um, academia, uh, civil society, uh, governments, and the different stakeholders, uh, private sector in this partnership, you were not only constantly working for this, but in the last year you really <laughs> took the next step in working tremendously. I don't know how you made it. Um, like 24 hours were not enough to making the next step towards the Global Shield. And I would like specifically to thank um, your uh, team and you personally, Special Envoy, uh, but really the V20 team also, who worked with Sarah Ahmed, but also other uh, colleagues so hard on making this happen. And of course, the Inter Resilience Secretariat, also my team, and so many others uh, of those partners uh, from private sector to make this happen. This was really a tremendous effort, but now we have made already or we have to make the next step and don't be complacent about the results in the p 
past. Um, because you rightly said the 500 million, the vision 2025, that's a great vision and it was bold at that time, but it's not enough. We know that it's not enough for what we have to see. So the Global Shield is a really great achievement and thank you for everybody working on this, that we now have really it fully operational with what the minister spoke about in Sharm el Sheikh, that is really great. And I think um, linking it to what I be part of, and also my colleague Jean-Christophe in the Transitional Committee on Loss and Damage, I think we are fully committed to the fund and all elements of the uh, Sharm el Sheikh decision. And we are also fully committed to find the best solution that is producing results in the most efficient and effective way for people right now. And this is what the injury resilience is showing, and this is what the Global Shield is about, as you were, were highlighting it. And therefore, we really have to take the next step on the prearranged agenda, and we have to establish, from my perspective, the Global Shield as the key element that is producing prearranged financing results on insurance, on social safety nets, on climate clauses, on whatever uh, you name it, but really being flexible, responsive. And that is the third thing I would like to highlight in your speech, I liked it so much. So it's country ownership, um, because this is also linked to what we hear in the TC. I try to continue the dialogue, the Glasgow dialogue that we will have this afternoon. Um, it's about national system, it's about national planning. Um, and we really have to link everything we are doing in the loss and damage uh, mosaic of things in the Global Shield, in the fund, with national plans, national pol policies, and national systems. So ownership, like Ghana is showing right now, is one of the Pathfinder countries, and the other Pathfinder countries is key. So, the last thing that uh, remains for me to, to really say is my third point, to ask all of you to continue your engagement. We really depend on all of you, but also to scale it up. Join the Global Shield and the different efforts, because all of us, we have to be bold and have to do the not imaginable to make progress if we don't want to see a really dire and difficult future for so many vulnerable countries and people around the world. So I count on all of you to step up and uh, push us also to make even better progress and more progress in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike Hen. I noticed your appreciation of efforts and that people had been working so hard, like 24 seven, and then you said, and we'll have to scale that up. So, but uh, appreciation and respect with all the differences among stakeholders, countries from, from different parts of the world is of course what is carrying a partnership like this. As the Inter-Resilience Global Partnership Annual Report was published in, on May 23, we wanted to just share some highlights here. Here are some of the achievements by partnership members reported from last year, 2022. These are your achievements, and they form a solid base for the transition and the future development of the Global Shield against climate risks. Just have a look, and then uh, have a closer look at the annual report to get the details. Before we turn to the keynote speech, we'd like to break the ice a little here and get you into a brief discussion with your neighbors. However, as you are likely sitting next to people you already know, I would like you to turn to somebody who's sitting in front of you or behind you and discuss the following question. Just give me a second. When it comes to addressing climate risks, what makes you feel optimistic today? And our online participants are not excluded. Please share your answers to this question as well in one word when it comes to addressing climate risks. What makes you feel optimistic today? You will see this on your screen next to the chat window um, and you can answer the question there. I'll give you all three minutes here in the room, turn around, discuss and online type away. Off you go.
Thank you. Yoo -hoo. I think this was three minutes. I do understand this is interesting. It was just meant as a three minute little icebreaker. And you can continue during the break. If you could turn around again, that would be great. I just want to see if one or two of you would like to share what makes you feel optimistic or what you discussed. We have Guillermo and uh, Angela here with microphones. Is anybody who'd like to volunteer what you discussed, something that makes you feel optimistic today when it comes to addressing climate risks? Oh, don't be shy. Yeah, there you go. Let me break the ice here. Uh, let me hold it. I feel like I'm horrible when you're holding it. I told Let him me, not to give it, it away. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if you look back 30 years ago when all these conversations about climate change or maybe more than that, there were no, not many instruments being established to respond to, to the need of the you know, small island countries of the developing world. As of now, I'm very optimistic because there had been, I mean, there have been some instruments being established. The Green Climate Fund, the crop of shield now, the loss and damage facility being launched last year, being announced. So these facilities are, you know, it's more like being created to respond to the need of the developing countries, particularly the small island countries in the Pacific. So I'm optimistic because they are facilities to respond to our need. Mm -hmm. Accessibility is another question, but that's another conversation on another day. But as long as we have some facility in place to assist us with our need in the Pacific, there will be a lot of requirement for schooling in the Pacific, educations, so that they can fully understand all these existence of these facilities. Yeah, that's the reason why. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lotu. One more, um, Dr. Kokofu. Okay, one more, uh, Guillermo. We can have the microphone again if you get it back from Lotu for Dr. Kokofu. <laughs> you see why I'm doing this, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope I'm limited to only one word, isn't it? Yes, yeah, awareness. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Kukufu. Awareness. Now, I would like to, we need to stop this because we are quest for time, but I love it that you're so active. Can we see what our online participants put in one word? What makes them feel up? Awareness. Thank you. There it is. And collaboration seems to be, seem to be the big ones. An appreciation of intro resilience is here. Uh, awareness even bigger. Collaboration. Youth. The partnership. There's momentum. There's innovation. There's awareness raising, so we have even more awareness. Thank you very much for participating uh, to our online participants and getting this into one word. So we're optimistic because of collaboration, because of awareness, and because there are mechanisms being set up. Thank you very much for, this, for your energy uh, and your interaction. I guess this is how it's going to continue throughout the day. Let's turn to the keynote speech, the Global Shield, a multifaceted approach to climate risk finance. <coughs> It is an unusual keynote speech, but quite fitting, a partnership or a forum of various stakeholders. We actually have five speakers who will share different perspectives on the global shield against climate risks in the broader context of loss and damage exacerbated by climate change. This is also reflecting that different actors have key roles to play in the global shield. Representatives from the COP28 presidency, the private sector, civil society, and donor countries will provide three to five minute impulse talks on their views on the Global Shield, its alignment with their own ambitions, and possibilities for engagement for greater and more impactful results. I will introduce them in turn and begin with uh, Jean-Christophe Donnellier. He's French member of the Transitional Committee on Loss and Damage and French representative on the board of the Green Climate Fund. He's currently Inspector General at the French Treasury and Chief of the Internal Audit. Jean-Christophe has served as Minister Councillor for Economic and Financial Affairs at the French Embassy in London, as the first interministerial coordinator in charge of technical cooperation, as Councillor to the OECD, and in several other roles, including in Brussels and in the US. Jean-Christophe, welcome. You have the floor.
Thank you. Uh, thank you. All. <laughs> Very happy to, to join you this, this morning. I will be brief, so let me tell you in three points why French is so much committed to this partnership. The first is uh, we know, we all know, and that has been said again yesterday morning during the, the first session of the Glasgow Dialogue, uh, which uh, Ike was uh, referring to earlier. Uh, we are not, the global community, let's say, let's put it that way, is not doing enough to support vulnerable countries to respond to the dramatic consequences of climate change. And specifically, what we have heard again and again, we are not delivering uh, adequate financing and certainly quick financing enough. And, and why is that? Because we have not been able to engage with this country on their resilient planning or their contingency planning. And I think in this respect, really, pre-arranged financing is a key element of the solution that we have to put forward as, a, as the global community. And you know that uh, the G7, uh, led by Germany and the V20, uh, has been working on that for some time, and the Insu Resilience Partnership has been really instrumental in this regard. Second point, but, but, we are not doing enough. There is a need to go a step further, and this is what the Global Shield is really about. Uh, and I am very proud to see that we are now uh, developing the first country package for nine identified countries, and that, that's my hope, that we, we, may, we may be able to make some announcement at the COP28 and have the first results on this new package. And talking about ownership, as you said, I could completely online with you on that. I think this package is really great on that, on that, on that regard. And finally, uh, if you look a step backward and look at the big picture, uh, what is going to happen, hopefully through the transitional uh, committee, we are working hard with ICER on that, uh, I think the global architecture is going to be changed a lot through the Charmel Sheikh decision when it comes to responding to loss and damage. That's my hope, but I think we have a unique opportunity to make that happen through the transitional committee. And really, I, I do expect that all of you, we are going to take a step even further with the result of this, of this, of this, of this transitional committee. The recommendation put forward for the, for the COP next, uh, this year, and the Global Shield has to be part of the, the follow-up of this, of this decision. So I am quite hopeful for that, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you in the, in the room who have been at the start of the, of the process. I don't know all of them, I know some of them, I don't know yet all of them, and I'm ex expecting to do, to do so quickly. And let me just conclude my, my remark in a few words about the next summit, which will be held in Paris, because it's very much related to that. Um, what we are expecting is really a, a political commitment along this line. No one has to choose between uh, fighting poverty and protecting the planet. So this summit will be about sending strong political messaging commitment, hopefully, on three elements. What we are already uh, discussing, and to give to this, uh, to this discussion some momentum, I will I'm referring to the, the debt burden, the, the use of the SDR, the, the reform of the MDBs and the World Bank. Uh, that's something that we're expecting some, some strong, strong wording. Then we have, uh, we have expectation on uh, some uh, ideas, uh, solution on the innovative sources of financing. And certainly, this is what I would like to highlight, we have expectation on how we define vulnerability in order to take better into account the vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis climate change. That's an important track of discussion in this summit, and hopefully we'll be able to deliver some, uh, some strong messaging, political messaging, and that as well. Thank you all. Uh, have a great uh, meeting today.
Goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Christophe, um, for the first bit of that keynote speech. Um, let us turn to uh, our next speaker, Dane McQueen, who is Director for Programs and Partnerships for the UNFCCC COP28 and United Arab Emirates Climate Change Special Envoy. Dane has previously served as Senior Advisor for Development and Humanitarian Affairs at the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dane, welcome. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you so or good morning, actually. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. This is a topic that's uh, very dear to our COP, uh, COP28 presidency, uh, and we're really pleased with the progress that we've seen uh, over the last year alone. Um, as you know, uh, loss and damage was dormant on the UNFCCC agenda for a long time and sort of exploded last year. Uh, and that's very promising. Uh, there's a, a lot of expectations, a lot of excitement, but it's also very risky. Uh, it, as a process, the UNFCCC is not known for keeping all of its promises. Uh, and there's a, a fear that this becomes another kind of empty promise. Um, at the same time, this year we have the global stock take, uh, which requires us to look across progress uh, uh, on all the pillars of Paris uh, and respond to the gaps and say, what are we going to do over the next seven years to close those gaps? So in this context, this is a, a high pressure environment uh, and the negotiations will go whatever way parties want them to go. But as the presidency, we want to ensure that there is a response to all of the global stock take gaps that happens outside the negotiations as well. Uh, so that there's a, a diversified package and it's not all eggs in one basket. Uh, and in this context, we are relieved <laughs> that Global Shield exists uh, and has made uh, so much concrete uh, implementation uh, progress uh, in, in, in this last period where people can say, after COP27, look, there's something to point to. At the same time, uh, Global Shield is also going to be burdened by high expectations. Uh, what happens next and does it happen at scale? Uh, it's very, very important and very one, uh, welcome uh, that there is uh, the V20 legitimacy uh, to this effort. Um, and we've been very happy to see also uh, the, the move towards specific country packages. I think that the kind of hope is that uh, even by COP28, uh, there can be a, a kind of next steps phase where we say, we have nine now, how do we get to 20, how do we get to 30? Uh, the other dimension that will be really important, and this is again something that there's been uh, positive work on, is, is embracing uh, fragile context um, and uh, not being scared away by perceived risk um, and, and only focusing on the safe environments uh, so that this doesn't become a uh, kind of another barrier uh, uh, for access to finance for countries in these, uh, in these settings. Uh, and the other part that we're also pleased to see, and again, this is a, a sort of testament to German leadership on this topic, is the, the anticipatory element. Um, we feel that when you have a, a credible disaster prediction, that's to be a threshold enough to release funding. You don't need to wait until the disaster happens. There's, very, there's no regrets to releasing money, particularly through cash payments early. Uh, so this is a, another area where I think uh, Global Shield can, can lead by example. Um, in terms of how this lands at COP28, uh, we are uh, hoping to feature this as one of the kind of key product outcomes in what we're calling the Relief, Recovery, and Peace Day. As you can tell, that's a, a heavily negotiated title already. Um, but this idea here is to put a human face on climate impacts and to show that there are uh, concrete and scalable solutions that can get money into very challenging settings uh, and that are uh, responsive to, you know, whether you call it extreme adaptation or loss and damage or climate security, but these impacts that all of our uh, consultations have gone back to again and again, uh, people who are facing droughts and floods and extreme heat uh, and uh, coming from our region, this is something we're uh, acutely aware of as well. So uh, thank you for the progress uh, and I, I uh, beseech you to do more as well, uh, and the presidency is there to support and to push more partners and more resources toward these efforts. So um, at the very, if, if not before then, we look forward to welcoming you in Dubai very soon uh, and having a, a really impressive relief, recovery, and peace day. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dane, um, for your perspective and your obvious commitment to a successful COP28 outcome. Let us now welcome uh, online Chikondi Chabuta, Advocacy and Partnerships Coordinator, Southern Africa at CARE International. Chikondi is a climate justice and women's rights activist from Malawi. She has previously, pre previously worked on gender justice and climate change for Action Aid and the Farmers Union of Malawi. She is regularly consulted by media such as The Guardian, The Washington Post, and iNews. Chikondi is joining us online today. There she is to share her piece of the keynote speech. Um, I hope you can hear us well, Chikondi, and let's see if we can hear you. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you, thank you. So, Chikondi, welcome to this meeting. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a privilege to be part of this panel, and I would like to thank uh, for the invitation to civil society throughout the process of developing the Global Shield and the high participation that we have had in the process. So today I would like to say that we are really uh, glad as civil society that we have been consulted and we continuously are consulted on how we do governance and how we administer the Global Shield. This is really important because the success of the Global Shield is now very clear in light of the loss and damage fund because the civil society will continuously take us back to where it matters. All of this is about the people on the front lines of climate crisis and how they should be part of the decision-making table. Uh, civil society will be part of the decision-making spaces at country level. And this is really important because we have had lessons from other funds that have come out of UNFCCC and how they have had difficulties in accessibility. They were there, but they were very difficult for people uh, to access. So being part of the Global Shield brings sort of excitement, but also hope that there will be speed, but there will also be the people being part of the decision-making spaces. We really want to ensure that as we have this space within the decision-making bodies, we have the fund accessible to those most affected. We are a grouping that you know, comprises smallholder farmers. We are people going through the climate risks ourselves, but we also have a, a, you know, indigenous people and those that are facing extinction because of this climate crisis. So the Global Shield will be there to ensure that civil society are having accessibility and then there's also transparency that is within the, uh, this uh, finance under the UNFCCC. We are aware that the Global Shield will be complementing uh, the work that is being done under UNFCCC under the Loss and Damage Fund. And it will be complementing and not uh, taking and uh, substituting the other. Many civil society members have been involved in projects and are in activities that are supporting the loss and damage finance. We have been on the front lines of pushing for this to take place and we are really excited to see that this is shaping up. And now we also have the Global Shield that is there to meet the needs of those most affected. We want to ensure that there is inclusion. And this is very clear when you look at the Global Shield and how it is structured and how we have vulnerable countries involved, especially within the country prioritization context, where we are including slow onset events, rapid events, and also other social safety net programs. So we really hope that this will continue where we are having meaningful participation of the most affected communities, particularly marginalized groups, but also indigenous peoples that are going to be meaningfully included in the design, in the implementation, including the monitoring of the fund. So um, this uh, Global Shield is really designed in a more of a bottom-up manner. Um, and we are happy with that because we want to avoid the mistakes of inaccessibility of other existing funds that are in place. Uh, my other uh, not, keynote speakers have alluded to this 
already. So we really want to have the affected communities uh, having a seat and a voting power within uh, the governance structures, being able to be able to communicate policies, guidelines in local languages when we have civil society in place where it is culturally appropriate and in channels that are easily accessible to really make sense for the people that matter. This uh, Global Shield, when we look at it, it really has uh, rights-based, people-centered, but also a gender equitable approach, leaning from the existence of uh, the Center of Gender, the Gender uh, Excellence uh, Center that is under the high-level consultative group. So we are very uh, assured that all the critical activities to ensure that the needs and priorities of the rights and of those that are in the most vulnerable situations, such as women and girls, indigenous peoples, persons living with disabilities, are guaranteed substantive equality. Any decision that is taken to address the loss and damage um, discussion will consider the existence of the Global Shield and where we have potential discrimination, we will be able to speak out within this platform that has been created. So we really want to have this intersectional analysis of gender where we are understanding issues of all those that are affected and the dynamics that are there within the different countries included within accessing the Global Shield. So we really hope and uh, we are very excited that the Global Shield has taken our, uh, our us on board and it is really important as, for us as civil society because where funding decisions are made when it comes to loss and damage is, it is it's, a, it's a matter of life and death for the people that are on the front lines. And this really ensure transparency, but also inclusion. Uh, we're really excited to see how the next phase uh, pans out but uh, really excited to have civil society present at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chikondi, appreciating the engagement of civil society and also underlining why it needs to continue and maybe even be enhanced in the Global Shield. Thank you very much, Chikondi. I think we see you again this afternoon in one of the breakout sessions. Thank you. I would like to now welcome Rowan Douglas, the chair of the Insurance Development Forum Operating Committee. 2014 to 2016, he led the creation of the Insurance Development Forum, IDF, of industry, governments, and international institutions to harness the role of insurance and reinsurance capabilities to meet the SDGs, and he has led the implementation group of the IDF. Rowan has served on the UK Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, the Royal Society's Working Group on Resilience to Climate Risk and Extreme Weather, the Executive Committee of the International Insurance Society, among other roles. Rowan, welcome, you have the floor. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, and it is a uh, an honor and a privilege to be a, a voice in, in the keynote choir. I, I've never been in a keynote choir before, but um, I am used to doing new things uh, with the Insure Resilience team. I, I remember, was it six years ago, Astrid? You brought us together. I've never had a meeting in a disused gas storage facility uh, in Berlin. We call them gasometers. And we have this meeting in a, in a re- reuse, very renewable gasometer, to talk about what became Insure Resilience. And um, I remember thinking, wow, this is a bit different. This is a bit edgy. And, um, and the German government and implementing agencies uh, are really wanting to shake things up here. And it was, it was wonderful timing because it, it mirrored some, some similar thinking that was beginning to happen in, in the private sector, in the private and mutual insurance sector as some of us have been lucky enough to be involved in the preparations for the 2030 Agenda in Sendai. And also um, some UN agencies. I see Jan Kellett here from UNDP, UNEP, UNDRR, or UNICR as it was then, and UNOCHA. Um, but it was the Insure Resilience Initiative and the German government that created the, the focal point to allow us all to move forward at scale. 
And of course, you've seen the figures. What's been so exciting and we're so grateful is that you embraced the commitment that we wanted to make as the, as the private sector to support practically on the ground, as well as with, with, with thinking. And you've enabled us to drive forward so much in, in many of the programs which, which were touched on. I want to just perhaps focus on two other uh, big elements. You've helped create a transformation in thinking. That's the big change and the change that we all see now at Sharman as we head to Dubai. Insurance is not an industry. It is an organizing framework for society. It is an institution of society, like market or diplomacy. Sometimes we call it welfare, sometimes we call it social insurance, sometimes we call it private sector insurance, but the concept of people coming together to pool resources to be an entitlement when certain events occur, but people will pull those resources and agree to collective behaviors to manage and reduce risk. That is an enduring cultural as well as scientific asset that has been forgotten. And if we're going to confront the climate emergency, both at local and global scales, we have to Re reimagine that concept, and it is being reimagined. We often talk about injecting transformative thinking and transformative alliances, but often people talk about that, but it doesn't happen. But with Ensure Resilience, it is happening, and now it's going to be turbocharged, we can all sense, with, with the Global Shield. So my, my final sort of concept to share, if I may, in the concept, in, in the context, I should say, of, of loss and damage. Some work done at, at University of Cambridge, published for Glasgow, actually. No one had done this work before, so it had to get, get done from scratch. 27% of global GDP is spent in risk-sharing systems. As I said, sometimes we call it welfare, sometimes we call it social insurance all sorts of other mechanisms. Broadly speaking, about three quarters of that is through taxation, 25% through insurance premiums of some description, but we are all collectively putting into a pot to manage actually often our own risk through our life, but actually the risk of, of a society. And that is actually what binds states and communities together. But almost, not quite, but almost all of that is risk sharing within states, within national, sometimes regional economies. What's so exciting about the loss and damage concept, both the formal mechanism, but also perhaps the wider mosaic, is to begin genuinely to share risk between states with differentiated responsibilities and differentiated capabilities to pay. That will create a sustainable framework for managing and sharing this risk, and it's gonna be the global shield that changes this mindset, but actually allows us to go back to our human, our human heritage and humanity's past. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan, for these inspiring words as part of the keynote choir. Thank you. Um, finally, we come to our fifth speaker, singer in the keynote choir. We welcome Renato Redentor Constantino, Red for short. Red is the managing director of the Constantino Foundation. He's also deputy chair of the Expert Advisory Group of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, as Dr. Kokofo pointed out, composed of 58 governments of countries most vulnerable to climate change. Red was formerly the Executive Director of the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, representing think tanks at the high-level consultative group of Intra Resilience. He's a member of the People's Survival Fund Board in the Philippines and has worked with international organizations and networks all across Asia. Red is also an accomplished author and working on a new book, The Ge Geography of Memory. Red, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, likewise, it's, it's, uh, 
it's an honor and it feels different to be part of the keynote choir. Um, two months before uh, the Paris Agreement was gaveled, the, v the Climate Vulnerable Forum, after a long time of discussion, chose to establish the V20 group of finance ministers to take climate action out of the oftentimes prison of the climate talks into the domestic economy where people are expecting action. And that move is also why we are talking about what we're talking about today. We're eager, of course, excited that we are heading towards, in October, the Akram to establish the Akram Marrakesh agenda, of which the Global Shield is certainly a major, major part of this. And that's why the V20 was formed as well, so that not only can V20 economies proceed, but proceed in partnership with other countries that are committed to deliver action. A lot of discussion today will be about the product, and the products of the shield actually speak very eloquently for it themselves, because the details are there, including the questions as to what it lacks. Always with the humility that the shield is not meant to solve everything, but it is meant definitely to solve a lot of things. And so when I was asked to share views on this keynote choir, I think the better part to, s to speak about would be three items, the first of which is something that is so obvious that we may often neglect it, which is the shield is important not only because of its products, but because it is an arena that seeks to rebuild trust. And as an arena, we get to demonstrate to so many other jaded countries and delegations that this agreement is welcome when trust is strong, because this is how we shape things together. No one has a perfect notion of the final things that we will need, not just in the shield, but in other areas as well. But if we can discuss our disagreements and realize that there are so many things we can do together that we agree on, then the shield is going to play a bigger part beyond what the products it offers. And that is gonna be very important. Impacts, you know, they're vital, they're scary, but we're also, in a bigger sense, we're also facing a bigger danger, which is the people losing faith in a process that is just taking so long. And it's difficult, that's why it's taking so long. And the talks, the climate negotiations, is essential. It cannot be set aside, but it is also slow. And that is why the shield is important, because we get to demonstrate that with trust and with effort, we get to move things fast. Our discussions in leading up to Charm was difficult, but that is why where we are right now is very special, because it's an outcome of real discussions. October last year, we were at zero. You know, and this year, what? We're at 250 million. Loss and damage facility expects, uh, the funding program of the V20 expects um, to raise about 3.5 million euros by the end of the year. Things are moving because the conversation has quality because there is confidence, and there are continuous going to be more pledges ahead because of this very point. So let's not lose sight of the fact that the shield is an opportunity to spread trust and to demonstrate what we can do together when we have confidence in one another. And when we ask sincerely, what do you mean without an accusation at the back? First point. Second point, we don't have time to build a vehicle that addresses every single danger that we're confronting. And this is why the shield is again important, because it recognizes that the train must not only be fit for purpose, it must also be moving already. And so we cannot wait 
our people cannot wait, as our, uh, as our colleague, uh, the Honorable Kokofu had said, they expect action. So we are building the train even as, as it is moving. We are building the engine. We are installing more wagons. We are installing more rail and tracks, even while the train is already moving. It's going to be difficult, but we all have different roles. That's why the V20 and CVF have been very, very committed to this process, because we all have contributions. With V20, we brought in not just questions of scale, but also issues and ideas like, how much risk do we share? Who takes on what burden? Can we develop instruments, financial instruments, for slow onset effects so that it's not just seen as an adaptation in terms of the response? We are evolving the toolkit. And by next year, whatever we have this year, may have something that's better because we are learning on the ground. And we are ready to see shortcomings, mistakes, missteps, or things we missed because there's an opportunity to correct and improve the following year. Again, that's why this is so important. And on that note, I think it's very important to also say that the G7 has a bigger challenge of matching the level of enthusiasm and leadership of Germany. The other members must step up. We're happy that France is also doing the, doing the same, but Germany has established a very high bar of collaboration. And we are hopeful. We're not optimistic because optimism means you are confident things will happen, so you lean back on your lawn chair because everything will be okay anyway. Pessimism, everything is doomed. You lean back as well. What we must be is not optimistic but hopeful because we're not sure if we will succeed in the future. Therefore, we fight for it. Therefore, we fight for it together. Lastly, my final point is we have to also remember that the SHIELD was the recipient of so much disinformation. But none of that, I think, is deliberate or with malice. In the UNFCCC climate negotiations community, we have all been through and still dealing with the trauma of bad politics. And so as we put things together in this tiny sphere that we have in the SHIELD, Ironically, I also want to leave with you the message that our work is under what is called the Global Shield, but we must be very protective of it now by implementing and showing why this information is wrong and showing to others what we are doing so that they can contribute as well because we don't hold all the answers. That's what the promise of the Shield is. We will evolve this together as the train moves and everyone is very much welcome to help us build that pathway because we have to reach the final destination with safety and prosperity for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Red, for these remarks and thanks to all in the keynote choir. My picture is now the keynote choir on the train. Um, voices from a global community or maybe even a family, obviously, with a lot of trust to speak frankly and hopefully. Thank you very much. We're a little over time and you know Germans get totally nervous when that is the case. So uh, we'll have a coffee break now. Um, I think the slide is there, shows you some of the information and uh, we'll move it a little bit. So it's just a 18 minutes break. You can bring your coffee cups, I think, in here if you wish. We're back here at 10.45 for the panel discussion. See you then, thank you very much. <laughs> Woo!